Coming up, artist Nicholas Gulanen reveals what's behind his massive installation under the Brooklyn Bridge. And a dentist is being honored for her work on the Navajo Nation. I'm Mark Trahant. Join us for those interviews, plus the headlines from the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Arizona State University welcomes 3,500 indigenous students from Arizona and across the nation. It serves one of the largest populations of indigenous students among U.S. colleges and universities. We created a sense of place for tribal nations to create futures of their own making through community outreach, and research, taught by world-class indigenous faculty where they see a reflection of themselves and their experiences. Find community at ASU. Thank you for joining us. Aliyah is away. We start today in Nebraska, where some Native American people are leading a search for their ancestors. Built on the original land of the Pawnee, the Genoa U.S. Indian Industrial School educated around 4,300 children from over 40 tribal nations. Starting in 1884, it is estimated that 80 students died at the 640-acre school. Because records of the cemetery location have not been discovered, the search continues. ICT's Kevin Abresk and Shirley Snavy have this report. So we're out here this week um, doing some investigation on one of those uh, anomaly features, as, as we call them, um, that turned up in uh, some of the ground penetrating radar data. And uh, we've laid out an excavation block and we're um, taking that down uh, really systematically, really slowly, um, in order to um, determine if we can identify first that anomaly that showed up in the uh, ground penetrating radar data, and second, uh, to determine if there are any uh, intact burials in this location. And it's a slow, it's been a slow process because how life is, sometimes you just don't have the support from the government, federal, state, and it just kind of happened that Secretary Holland <laughs> was uh, appointed by this administration, and that really helped, you know, put the um, boarding school initiative as one of her top priorities. And uh, the lens of that, also the Genoa Digitizing Reconciliation Project at the Great Plains Center, that was a big uh, part of our research, and that's ongoing. Uh, so things came together finally, and it's taken us several years just to get now here to this search. Representatives from tribal nations and descendants of Genoa students were at the site. I look at it as a ceremony. I don't perceive it as exhuming or a, a dig or anything like that. Those words are so harsh and they're very colonialized. And that's really not what this is about. Um, it's about finding answers and finding um, the children and we want to give them the respect and honor that they deserve and that they did not have. No remains were found when the search ended Thursday. Work will continue sometime later. In Genoa, Nebraska, with Kevin Aberask, Shirley Snavy, ICT News. In Alaska, rural villages are receiving millions of dollars in federal funding for water infrastructure. The United States Environmental Protection Agency announced over $39 billion in grant funds last week to prioritize improving water facilities in remote parts of the states. According to the EPA, the money will be used for training, technical assistance, and education programs. In addition, the money will be used to address exposure to emerging contaminants, some of which pose a threat to many Alaska Native villages. That includes actions to replace lead service lines and other chemicals harmful to health, such as PFAS. These are long-lasting chemicals that break down slowly over time, and scientific studies have shown that PFAS are harmful to humans. Details for how to apply for these grants have yet to be announced by the EPA. In Ecuador, an indigenous rights advocate is getting some major attention for his run for president. 
Last week, Yacu Perez received backing from several political movements ahead of the country's presidential election on August 20th. A number of organizations came together to host a campaign event where they announced their support for the presidential candidate. In his 2021 run, the indigenous rights and environmental activists also received a high level of support. After the campaign event, Perez visited the Ecuadorian capital of Quito to share his views directly with potential voters. Because the presidency of the Republic is not the end for us. It is the means to change the course of history that all Ecuadorians want, and that's what I want before you. Before the personalities of the first row and even the last row to tell you that I assume a commitment, a commitment to change direction, we no longer support so much structural violence. We no longer support violence in the streets, homicides, murders. The history of state-recognized tribes in North Carolina are being highlighted in a new way. Last month, the state's Highway Marker Commission approved applications to put up nine markers along roadside. Carrie Bird is a Lumbee descendant and the director of the North Carolina American Indian Heritage Commission. He told North Carolina Public Radio WUNC the effort is to tie these tribes to the history of the state. In November, installation ceremonies are set to take place for several of the markers. And those are the headlines for the ICT Newscast. Artist Nicholas Gulanen is no stranger to high-profile installations. He gained wide recognition for his piece, Indian Land, that echoed the famous Hollywood sign. Today, he has a monumental piece under the Brooklyn Bridge that in New York that simply proclaims land. ICT's Stuart Huntington caught up with the Gulanen in his hometown of Sitka, where he is taking some time with family to catch and smoke salmon. Nicholas, welcome. You have a massive installation under the Brooklyn Bridge in New York City. It's very powerful. Tell us about that. This is truly is a global conversation. And, and I think of the history of, of New York and Lenape territory. I think of the, um, cho I often think of the chosen histories that are represented in place opposed to um, things that are, you know, purposefully ignored or, or, and I, and I feel like this work offers a lot of entrance for various perspectives in a space like this. Um, whether it's people that are navigating colonial borders, whether it's colonial borders that cross indigenous territories and space. And I feel like this touches on a lot of that and referenced the material was sourced from the U S Mexico border wall which is still being constructed now. To me, that is a, a scar that's continually being made of colonial violence across our, our indigenous territories and lands um, that cuts off communities, that cuts off all the beings that we share land with, water with, waterways, and, and this um, real disconnected, unnatural attempt at containment. Um, and so some of that gets very political pretty quick with, with how people view the, their positioning on, on what that wall represents to them, I suppose. And, um, part of this work was removing that wall material and, and building something else in conversation. So it was a reference to also pop art. And for me, that reference is. It touches on a few things. It touches on the title. In every language, there's land. Um, it touches in our responsibility for land and our responsibility to care for land. And I really love seeing everyone interact with it. A lot of this work that you that we put out there as artists and, and share publicly in space uh, takes on its own life and, and, and engagement with space and community and for this work it's been really uh i feel like it's been really enjoyable from my you know place here is um and role in that work to to watch everyone engage to see uh that space filled with with you know children playing and families and 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 interacting in such a different way than than what 
that material alone was meant to be. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I feel like everybody has a stake in the story too of of connection to something like that. So, Nicholas, you've studied in London, New Zealand. Tell us about how that has influenced your work. Every every aspect of my education has been impactful in ways and um before that i started you know i started as an artist in my community sitka shika shika kwan sitka is the home community and i started off apprenticing with, with my father my late father kinda dave galanon my my uncle uh will burkhart who's uh, um i still work with going through tr like customary uh, apprenticeships with elders and 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 masters or teachers of, of the culture here and that was really a core foundation to what i do now i didn't want to study in the u.s uh for me it was important to try to see more of 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 the world of different cultures of uh, different perspectives my undergraduate was at london guild hall and that was you know, sometimes the things that we get from education aren't what we expect them to be in a sense. So like I learned from some like negative experiences out there. When I was there working, there was conversations of, I cannot bring my indigenous culture to the curriculum. It was too literal. It was this, it was that, it wasn't this, it wasn't that. And, and I, that, that shaped me in a way that I didn't expect back to really understand till later, I suppose. I didn't have the tools or mechanisms to respond while I was there, but I connected that directly to forced assimilation, boarding schools, kill the Indian, save the man, of things that we're, you know, we're not allowed to have our identity in these spaces, but we're told to go to these spaces to succeed. So I'd, I'd kept sketchbooks and ideas that I'd never brought into my mentors or tutors or anything. I realized that it, they couldn't engage in this conversation. And, you know, I fulfilled my requirements for that degree and left. And um, that's why I went to, to Aotearoa in New Zealand, working with Robert Yonke at Maori visual arts program. Obviously, I wasn't studying Maori culture. I was working with my Klinkit Unanga perspectives and culture. And um, there I was allowed to bring these conversations to institutional space and university settings. And, and there I finally, you know, I felt like they wanted me to succeed. There I, I got deeper connections and understandings of the complexities and got tools for this, navigating this, uh, these spaces as indigenous people that these other universities would really just shut you out of and shut you down at the, the, from the start of. So, so that was really impactful for me both both sides of that experience. Okay, so what's next for Nicholas Galanin? I um, recently completed a, a Coutier totem pole, recently completed this project, opened up a new, new work at the Liverpool Biennial, which is up right now. And I am currently doing, creating new work for the Armory. Uh, Candace Hopkins is curating some solo exhibition spaces at the Armory in September in New York the 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 art fair and i'm working on a new record because i'm you know i make music as well under yet scene with um our last record was out on sub pop in seattle so i'm working on the next record right now with that that's a slow enjoyable process but um got a solo exhibition opening at site santa fe in october um uh, so i'm working on that and yeah, I think um, right now also I'm home with my family. We're fishing right now and smoking smoking salmon and processing. I kind of took the month off so I can be home and, and do some of that, which is also really important. Uh, it's very important. Nicholas, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you.
When we ate indigenous foods, wild rice, berries, nuts, fish, and wild game, we did not experience diabetes or obesity. Nowadays, children across the U.S. eat too many empty calories and drink sugar-sweetened beverages. Our Native families suffer more with the lack of access to fresh, nutritious foods. I want to be it in prevention, teaching knowledge and skills at a young age. Our babies' first feedings are so important. This practice of eating well to nourish our body, it's learned by the time our babies turn to. Teaching family spirit, I can see knowledge and skills taking root. We want our children to get the benefits of breast milk, nurse as long as possible, then learn to eat healthy and avoid soda pop and eat fresh foods. I'm teaching this program called Family Spirit Nurture. It's a home visiting program created by and for Native people that promotes nutritional health for parents and their children. It really helps our young caregivers with practical skills and makes a difference. Family Spirit Nurture's six lessons are just what new parents need to know about nutrition for babies and young children. We teach parents how to know when infants are hungry and full, how and when to start solid foods. We help parents figure out how to create sleep schedules and plan meals. Lessons focus on sugar moderation and healthy eating. Family Spirit Nurture has been proven an effective strategy for promoting healthy infant feeding and growth in the first year of life. Based on demand, the Family Spirit team at the Johns Hopkins Center for Indigenous Health is making Family Spirit Nurture available for any community to adopt. I would encourage others to bring Family Spirit Nurture to their people. My vision of our community is that we have these babies growing up healthy, overall, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. We're going to have these beautiful kids living that good life and having the value system our ancestors meant for us to practice. Indigenous people in the Andean Mountains north of Ecuador are already welcoming winter. ICT's Vincent Moniz has the story. On June 24th every year, natives from the town of Cotacachi celebrate the season by dancing in their village to the main square. The celebrations are part of the town's sun festival, which they have held for decades. Indigenous people during the Southern Hemisphere's winter solstice honor an ancient Incan sun god with the hope that this year's fruits and vegetables will be enough to feed everyone through the winter. This one-day event marks the end of the harvest season and honors Mother Earth for this year's crops. Members of the indigenous communities spoke more about why they honor the sun and what it represents. Patricio Ruiz says the Sun Festival represents the celebration of the harvest in all communities, giving thanks to the sun god for the food, the corn, and all the grains. Patricio says they represent the livelihood of all communities. And Santos de la Cruz says they have always maintained their culture, dancing and stamping their feet to show their joy and gratitude to the sun, which Santos says gives warmth to plants humans, and all living things. Though everyone seems to be in good spirits at this year's event, that wasn't always the case. Until a few years ago, these festivities would end in fights between indigenous communities seeking command over the village's square. The flute players and the harmonica players, they stand out in the dance groups. These musicians mark the rhythm while the dancers vibrate the floor with powerful stomping. There's food and drinks for everyone during the celebration, and for those looking for an adult drink, there's chicha, which is fermented from grains, corn, or fruit. And when the Sun Festival is over, most everyone packs up, goes home, and prepares for winter. In Bismarck, North Dakota, Vincent Monez, ICT News.
A Navajo dentist has received a prestigious award from her peers. Darlene Sorrell has been named one of the 12 health equity heroes in the honor given by DentaQuest. Dr. Sorrell, who joins me now, chairs the board of Nijoni Smiles, and she's also a co-founder of the Society of American Indian Dentists. Congratulations, Dr. Sorrell, and welcome. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate the invitation. Tell us about your honor and uh, what do you think it means? Well, I, I don't feel like I should be the only one being honored. There's um, people who during COVID kept the, the program open and continue to try to um, seek out funding and see patients there at this point. So I feel like they are the ones that need to be honored. Dental health is so important and it's often not thought of the same way. And I, I'm curious, how important is it to get people to think differently about oral health and why it's so important? I think um, most people don't realize how dent the mouth is connected to the rest of the body, if you believe that or not. They feel um, like, you know, some people feel like they can just remove a tooth and the problem will be gone. It is connected to high blood pressure, to diabetes, um, to a number of other medical issues that um, I think we need to educate um, individuals at the a grassroots level, knowing that if they do pay attention to their mouth, it will result in better overall health for themselves. Tell me about uh, Najoni Smiles and its role in the community. Najoni Smiles was opened as a nonprofit, and it is the only nonprofit on the Navajo Nation um, in 1994. And um, it is the only clinic that provides um, braces for children and adults on the Navajo Nation. It is a nonprofit, and it's um, so it's not affiliated with with Indian Health Service. Um, they do collaborate on some things, but for the most part, they are the only um, nonprofit dental clinic on the Navajo Nation. So um, that during COVID, they've really um, are had struggled. Um, I'm sure um, there was some that are aware that during now, during the COVID years, it really impacted the Navajo Nation significantly and also in the Joni Smiles. So we are basically in recovery stage at this point. And so seeking funding and seeking um, um, providers and training providers and educating the community are some of the things that we feel are important and hope to continue in the future. I think there's a lot of people that wonder what the relationship is between nonprofit healthcare organizations such as yours and the Indian Health Service and how to figure out what's the best route to use or to make sure you're getting the best service. Well, the um, Native American people have three times the dental disease rate compared to the general population. I was um, a provider in the a dental director in the Indian Health Service for 37 years, and I retired on May the 2022. And so I'm very familiar with the Indian Health Service. And every time I went to conferences in regards to dental disease, it, it has never decreased over the um, 37 years that I've been a part of Indian Health Service. And it's nothing that they've done bad. They've been funded to fail basically. And so they're using their money the best they can, but there's plenty of, of need out there that not only Indian Health Service, but other entities, whether it's private sector that accept Medicaid, because a lot of American Indians are on Medicaid, or um, nonprofits that exist on, Nav on nat native lands um, that can contribute to the efforts to try to decrease, to educate, regarding dental disease on, on the native lands. I'm curious what uh, incur what influenced you to become a dentist? When I was in, in grade school, um, they used to do screenings in the schools. And um, I never went to the dental clinic. I'm one of nine children. And um, I don't think it was any um, problem that my parents had, but 
they grew up believing that if you have, you only go to the dental clinic if you have tooth pain, and some still believe that now to this day, but they didn't believe going in and getting checkups was necessary. So during that school screening, they um, advised me as of when I was like nine years old, that if I should brush my teeth, my gums will stop bleeding. And I found the only toothbrush in the house, I'm sure, and started brushing my gums and my teeth. And lo and behold, it stopped bleeding. And from there on, it, it just kind of, it, it, I was just starting to get interested. And if this is true, what else is true? And I did pay for my own braces at the time because my parents couldn't afford it. And it, so when I went into um, school, undergraduate school at University of Arizona, I just knew that that was what I wanted to do. Dr. Shrell is one of this year's health equity heroes. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all of the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.